Hey guys, it's Richard. You're watching The Plain Bagel. As you probably heard by now, we've had another big update with the regional banking turmoil in the US. As it was announced this Monday morning that First Republic Bank, a mid-sized bank located in San Francisco, has been taken over by the FDIC and effectively sold to JP Morgan, making it the third US bank to come under FDIC receivership and the fourth bank to effectively fail in less than 90 days. First Republic Bank was marginally bigger than Silicon Valley Bank, making it the second largest bank failure in US history, behind only Washington Mutual back in 2008, and had been on the radar since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. They were the recipient of that $30 billion deposit from industry players to try and stem the worst fears and as a show of confidence in First Republic Bank. Um, but clearly that wasn't enough. After reports of turmoil and a weekend of rush bidding and meetings with regulators, we found out this morning that JP Morgan will indeed be buying uh, many of the assets of First Republic. And as of today, depositors will have full access to their funds with the 84 branches of First Republic opening as JP Morgan branches this morning. And while the situation has been more controlled than with Silicon Valley Bank, it is still a negative update. Many had been hoping that the worst of the bank runs from March and their impact were behind us. Even still, as your designated boring finance internet guy, I wanted to cover the situation and cover all the details that are worth knowing about because this is a high risk and scary situation, obviously. Uh, but as of currently, we haven't yet seen as drastic of an impact on other regional banks. And there are sort of other details that are worth knowing about when trying to assess the severity of the situation at hand. So what happened with First Republic Bank? Well, as mentioned, it first came onto the radar back with Silicon Valley Bank's collapse when its stock took a big hit and it received that $30 billion deposit from other financial institutions who were trying to stem the worst depositor fears around this institution. But on Tuesday alone, the stock lost half of its value after the bank released its first quarter earnings, which importantly showed how the bank performed during the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in March. And the big update was that the bank saw $100 billion of customer deposits withdrawn over this period, causing a net decline of 40.8% from its year-end deposit balance. And if you exclude that $30 billion from other financial institutions, this represented a 56.7% decline in total deposits, more or less occurring within a couple of weeks. Now with the release, management did announce that they were pursuing different strategic alternatives, such as selling off assets, reducing the reliance on uninsured deposits, reducing borrowings and laying off roughly a quarter of their workforce in the second quarter. But on Friday, it turned out that things might've been worse than management had been alluding to. As CNBC put out an article where citing an anonymous source, it was indicated that First Republic was headed for FDIC receivership the same path that we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. With the source highlighting that the FDIC was actively seeking out bids from other financial institutions, with this news causing the stock to lose three quarters of its value over that trading week. And over the weekend, we had updates around the bids being submitted, the meetings with regulators, and a lot of speculation as to what was going to happen with First Republic, which brings us to Monday when it was announced that JP Morgan would be the one purchasing the assets of First Republic Bank. The terms of the deal include that JP Morgan will be paying 10.6 billion US dollars for the institution, which is over 15 times its market cap, but it does get quite a few benefits from this deal. Uh, they will not assume any of the corporate debt or preferred shares of uh, First Republic Bank, meaning that they lose a bunch of the liabilities. The FDIC will help finance the deal and most of the acquired loans will have a loss share provision where the FDIC will share the burden of any losses in that portfolio. And while it's still early, we have already seen some criticisms of this deal. For one, it violates a US law that prevents banks from acquiring other banks if they represent 10% of US deposits, which JP Morgan certainly does. And JP Morgan actually announced that they expect to make a profit from this deal with them actually expecting to report a gain as a result of this acquisition. But the silver lining is again that depositors do still have access to their funds uh, with all this being sorted out over the weekend. So that's where we are today. And it might lead you to wonder, why did First Republic Bank fail? Why was it the domino to fall with the banking turmoil? Especially given that it was largely seen as having a very attractive customer base. It largely catered to high net worth clients, who, as reported, rarely defaulted on their loans. And unlike Silicon Valley Bank, this had nothing to do with turmoil with startups or in the venture capital space, uh, any sort of industry concentration risk. So what was it about First Republic Bank that caused them to fail? 
Um, well, similar to the Silicon Valley Bank situation, the company did have a high amount of uninsured deposits with the amount sitting at 67.7% as of the end of 2022. And again, like Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic had put a lot of its customer deposits in long-term assets. Not quite treasuries like Silicon Valley Bank. They did obviously have a portfolio that had unrealized losses, but these losses were a lot smaller than what Silicon Valley Bank had, uh, roughly 34.3% of their CET1 capital versus the 110% for Silicon Valley Bank. But First Republic Bank did have a big mortgage portfolio. In fact, their primary business is lending out mortgages for single family properties. And these mortgages had very long terms to maturity. With 81.3% of outstanding loans having maturities above five years and 62.4% having maturities above 15 years. Now mortgages are obviously different from treasuries, but they do have a lot of similarities and they are actually treated similarly by a number of institutions. Uh, for one, they share the same property where as interest rates increase, the value of a mortgage and a treasury both decrease and the longer that that loan is outstanding, the more extreme that relationship is. And while they do represent a loan provided by the bank, mortgages can be sold similar to securities. Uh, there is a market for buying mortgages, which is why we have mortgage backed securities. Uh, but that market is less liquid than the treasury market which obviously makes things even trickier. So similar to Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic had a lot of customer withdrawals concentrated over a very short period of time and had the money required for those deposits tied up in long-term assets, long duration assets that had fallen in market value, meaning that if they were to sell those assets, they would realize a significant loss. Now, unlike Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic didn't have to yet sell assets to meet withdrawals. They instead just increased short-term borrowing to meet the withdrawal needs. Uh, which was especially helped with the Federal Reserve's discount window provided on the back of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Basically, rather than selling assets to meet the high withdrawal needs, First Republic simply borrowed against these assets with the Federal Reserve allowing these banks to use the par value of these securities so it wouldn't be impacted by the fall in market value. And you can see that the company reported that its short-term borrowing increased from 6.7 billion to 80.4 billion during the first quarter, the vast majority of which was from that Federal Reserve discount window. But even though First Republic had kicked the can down the road by at least a year, thanks to these loans, it does seem like the FDIC wasn't willing to give them the chance or the time to try and sort things out on their own. Um, which brings us to where we are today. Now, all this might lead you to wonder if there is a bigger problem at play here, if this is just another domino in a long set, given that, again, many were hopeful that the situation was already behind us. While we will likely to continue seeing challenges in the banking space, we are far from out of the woods, and I don't really want to write off the risk of, say, another regional bank failing, because we are certainly in a heightened risk environment. But so far, it does seem like First Republic did bear the brunt of the bank runs from the first quarter, uh, because while all this is playing out, we did actually get the earnings release of other regional banks that people were concerned about. And so far, we haven't seen as acute of an impact on these other institutions. Of the banks that have reported, PacWest Bank Corp was the next biggest hit by deposit withdrawals, with it seeing a 16.9% hit which while material is still meaningfully less than what First Republic Bank experienced. And that institution does have three quarters of its deposits covered by the FDIC insurance, which again should help stave the worst of the bank run concerns. Now there is a chance that the earnings release of First Republic could set off more withdrawal activity. And there is a chance, for example, that that's what caused uh, First Republic to enter FDIC receivership by that weekend. But the actions to manage the situation do put us in a better situation than with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, where we had kind of no idea how things were going to play out. And the banks do have more tools at their disposal, like the Federal Reserve discount window, which while helping banks operate through the turmoil, should also provide some reassurance to customers that they'll have access to their funds, which could reduce the potential of another bank run. And while I definitely don't want to spin a banking crisis into a uh, positive, I will highlight that banking crises are deflationary in nature. And if we do see an impact on inflation, there is a chance that the Federal Reserve pauses rate hikes or even cuts rates which would actually cause those long-term assets to increase in value and would relieve some pressure for regional banks. And there is a chance that the worst is behind us that we don't see this necessarily spread to another institution. According to management, deposit activity had actually stabilized at the bank by the end of March and remained stable through April 21st. Deposits were at 102.7 billion on April 21st, down only 1.7% from March end. Even still, it's pretty clear that we are far from out of the woods in terms of the risk around regional banks. That's not to say there's a reason to panic, 
Uh, but there are other factors to consider that will still be applying pressure to regional banks in the US. For one, with higher yields, we have seen this movement of money from deposits into term deposits, which pay the depositor a higher return, given that interest rates have increased quite rapidly. We have seen some money move from regional banks into larger institutions that many believe are too big to fail, that many believe will never be allowed to fail, such as JP Morgan, which actually saw its deposits increase in the first quarter on the back of the Silicon Valley bank turmoil. And as has been highlighted, all this has been exacerbated by the age of digital banking, where before people would have to line up to get their money out of a bank, a lot of this can happen instantaneously online, which many banks are simply not equipped to handle. Even still, that doesn't mean that every regional bank is headed for the same fate as First Republic Bank. They were the most acutely impacted by the rapid withdrawals back in March. And while there are other factors that regional banks will have to grapple with, the concentrated nature of the withdrawals that we've seen with Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic does highlight that bank runs are the first and foremost risk being faced here. And as of yet, we haven't seen other regional banks hit as hard, which should stem the worst fears. There's a chance that the earnings release from First Republic Bank and its subsequent failure do prompt another wave of withdrawals, uh, but we just don't know at this point in time. That's obviously speculation, and I would really encourage you to try to avoid the wild speculations we've seen around this event. There are a lot of people, unfortunately, kind of making a name for themselves by doomsaying with uh, the fallout we've seen, but it's not the beginning of the end of the US financial system, and there's no stat that we currently have access to that will predict what will happen next, uh, that will tell us the complicated outcome of Federal Reserve actions, of bank actions, and depositor actions. Because at the end of the day, a lot of this is largely about depositor behavior and trust around financial institutions and the system as a whole. Both of which, as you would imagine, are very difficult to forecast or predict. Now, thankfully, we do have more tools than last time, and it does seem like the interventions with First Republic Bank did back in March stem the worst of the withdrawals from the institution because we did see that significant slowdown after the deposits and actions from the Federal Reserve. But nonetheless, the situation as a whole is developing and will be an historic moment for the US financial system. So that's a video. I hope it helped to explain things and provide a more balanced perspective. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of speculation around the situation, but we just don't know. And in circumstances where we don't know what will happen, uh, it doesn't really make sense to use the, the wildest speculations as your sort of baseline assumption. Uh, so be careful with uh, who you, you give the time of day to uh, while acknowledging that we are in a very high risk situation around banking. That's all for now. And until next time, be safe out there.